can hardly prove for beauty and brilliance these days. <laughs> it seems that there are millions of these. What are the millions these days? Specialness is the rigor above average is average. Go figure. Is it some modern miracle of calculus that such frequent miracles will render each one unmiraculous? of this. <gasps> Look, am I, am I, am I fat? Miss Wormwood, you're pregnant. What? You're going to have a baby. But I've got a baby. I don't want another one. <laughs> Isn't there something you can do? You're not look pregnant. It's a bionic sword. Oh my good lord. What about the biannual international amateur salsa and ballroom dancing championships? A baby, Miss Wormwood, a child, the most precious gift the natural world can bestow upon us has been handed to you. Oh, bloody hell. Every life I bring into this world stores my faith in humankind. Push, Mrs. Wormwood, push! I'll push you in a minute. Each newborn life, a canvas yet unpainted, this still unbroken skin, this uncorrupted mind. Unbelievably unlikely. The chances of existence almost infinitely small. The most common thing in life is love. And yet, Semi-formal, semi-Spanish gown I should be wearing in the semi-formal 
Yes, sir, that's right, sir. 155 brand new luxury cars. Are they good runners? Well, you wouldn't beat them in a race. Yes. No, no, they, they are good runners. Harry! Hang on. Look at this, Harry. She's reading a book. That's not normal for an eight-year-old. I think she might be an idiot. <laughs> Listen to this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. Oh. Would you stop scaring your mother with that book, boy? I'm a girl. And she keeps trying to tell me stories, Harry. Stories? Who wants stories? I mean, it's not normal for a girl to be all thinking. Would you please shut up? I'm trying to make the biggest business deal of my life here, and I have to listen to this. It's your fault you spent us into trouble, and you expect me to get us out of it. What am I, a flaming escapologist? Oh, escapologist, he says. What about me, then? I have a whole house to look after. Themselves, you know. If you're an escapologist, I must be an acrobat to balance that loss. The world's greatest acrobat. Now, I'm off to bleach my roots, and I shan't be talking to you for the rest of the evening, you poor little man. But I'm gonna make us rich. Rich? How rich? Very rich. Businessmen, very, very stupid. Your genius husband is gonna sell them 155 natural bangers as brand new luxury cars. But that's not fair. The cars will break down and what about the businessmen? Fair? Listen to the boy. I'm a girl. Fair will not get you anywhere, you twit brain. All I can say is thank heavens Michael has inherited his old man brains, eh, son?
is... Secrets! Yes, secrets. <laughs> the secret to my success in business is this. Oil of violence, hair tonic for men. Now stand back some while your old man goes to work. <laughs> now in business, son, a man simply cannot fail to get noticed when he looks like this. Lord, woman, have you started already? It's not even 8.30. My hair, it's green. Green? What did you do that for? Why do you want green hair? I don't want green hair. I didn't do anything. Maybe you used my mommy's peroxide by mistake. That's exactly what you've done, you stupid man. My hair, my lovely hair. Oh, my good Lord. I have my field today. I know. I know you could do. What is it? What can I do? You could pretend you're an elf. Yes, that's it. I can pretend I'm a... What are you talking about, you fool? This boy's a loony. Mom, do you want to hear a story? Oh, don't be disgusting. Go on, creep on back to that library of yours or something. The sooner you're locked up in school, the better. Back at the library again, are we? Yes. Well, my mom wanted me to stay home with her. She hates it when I go out. She misses me too much. My dad, too. He loves having me around. But I think it's important for grown-ups to have their own space sometimes. Your parents must think they're so lucky to have a girl as clever as you. And do you tell them lots of stories like you do with me? Oh, I do love your stories, Matilda. And that's all I hit, by the way. But if you did happen to have a story you wanted to tell me, once upon a time, the two greatest circuit performers in the world, an escapologist who could escape from any lock ever invented, an acrobat who was so skilled it was as if she could actually fly. The two fell in love and got married. They performed some of the most incredible feats together, and their love for each other was so strong, it was said that cats would purr as they walked by, and dogs would weep with joy. They moved into the beautiful, most beautiful old house on the edge of the town, and in evenings, they would take walks. Each night, the children of the town would wait in anticipation, hoping to catch a glimpse of the shining white scarf the acrobat always wore. For then they knew they'd only to cry tricks, tricks, and the great performers would instantly oblige with the most spectacular show just for them. But although they loved each other, although they were famous and everyone loved them, they were sad. We have everything. We have everything the world has to offer, said the wife. We have everything. But we do not have the one thing in the world that we want most. But the one thing. We do we not, not have, have a, child. a child. Patience, Patience my, my love. love. Patience, my love, the husband replied. Time is on our side. <coughs> Even time loves us. Oh, Matilda. But time is the one thing that no one is a master of. And as time passed, they grew quite old and still had no child. Matilda, this is very sad. Do you want me to stop? Don't you dare. Their sadness overwhelmed them and drew them onto ever more dangerous feats as their work became the only place to escape the inescapable tragedy of their lives. And so it was decided to perform the most dangerous feat ever known to man. It is called, said the husband, announcing the event to the world press who had gathered with bated breath. The burning woman hurling through the air with dynamite in her hair over the sharks and spiky objects caught by the man locked up in the cage. It is the most dangerous trick ever known to man. Smiling sadly, slipping her 
hands into his, it is where the loneliness of life has led us. Well, what happened? I, I don't know. Not yet, anyways. What, but isn't there some more? I, I mean, just a little bit? <laughs> well, I'm sure your mother will be expecting you. Is she here? I'd love to meet her, actually. Maybe I could- Bye, Miss Phelps. See you tomorrow.
class. My name is Miss Honey, and today is a very special day, your first day at school. Now, do any of you know your two times tables? Wonderful. Miss Hilda, isn't it? Please stand and do as much as you can. One times two is two, two times two is four, three times two is six, four times two is sixteen, five times two is ten, seven times two is fourteen, eight times two is sixteen. Stop, stop. How far can you go? I don't know. Quite a long way, I think. How about this? Now this is much harder, so don't worry if you don't get it. But two times four hundred and eighty-seven. If you took your time. Nine hundred and seventy-four. No way. Let's leave math for the time being and look at reading. Can anyone read this?
I told them my uh, regional violence is not violent, uh, manufacturing mistake. Was that true? Of course it's not true. So you lied? Of course I lied. And they didn't believe you? Of course they didn't believe me. I've got green hair. I've got hair. <laughs> and what's this? Another flaming book? What's wrong with the telly? No, it's from the library. It's a library book. You shut up, little brat. <laughs> now, get out of here, you little stinkworm. Do we have any super glue? In the cupboard. And while you're at it, why don't you stick that stupid book to your stupid head? <laughs>
made a very big mistake. Just so you all know, she's my best friend. Wow. Some way along the way, my dear, you've made 
arrived. It was like the entire world had gathered to see the burning woman hurling through the air with dynamite in her hair over the sharks and spiky objects caught by the man locked up in the cage. Everything was arranged by the acrobat's evil sister, a frightening woman who loved nothing more than to scare the children of the town. It was whispered that in her dark and brooding heart, she resented nothing more than her sister, both her success and her love. Suddenly, out came the escape Aldris, dressed in his usual tights and spangly costume. But there was no sign of the acrobat and not a glimpse of her shining white scarf. He strode onto the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the burning woman hurling through the air with dynamite in her hair over sharks and spiky objects caught by the man locked up in the cage has been canceled. No. Canceled because my wife is pregnant. Oh, Matilda. Silence, absolute silence. Then suddenly, the audience jumped to its feet and roared with appreciation. The applause lasted for nearly an hour, and the great feat was instantly forgotten. So it has a happy ending? Forgotten by everyone except the acrobat sister. When all had quieted down, she stepped forward and produced a contract. A, a contract? A, a contract, contract you have signed to perform this feat, and perform this feat you shall. I have paid for the poster, publicity, and toilet facilities. A contract is a contract is a contract. The burning woman hurling through the air with dynamite in her hair over the sharks and spiky objects caught by the man locked up in the cage shall be performed and performed on this day or off to prison you both shall go. No, no! Well, what happened next? I don't know. I'll tell you the rest tomorrow. What, but I don't know if my nerves won't make it until tomorrow. Are you crying? Maybe I shouldn't tell you anymore. Oh no, Matilda, we must see how it ends. And I'm not crying because it's sad. It's just that they wanted this child so very much. It must be so wonderful for a child to feel so wanted. Yeah, wonderful. Bye. Silent. 
apologize for some of the things that have been going on today. They are very horrible things. I'm, of course, talking about reading. Now, somewhere on a show, I heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. So telly, if you bother to take a look, is the equivalent of, like, lots of books. All I know I learned from telly, this big, beautiful box of facts. If you know a thing already, baby, you can switch your channel over just like that. Endless joy and endless laughter, folks living happily ever after. All you need to make you wise is 23 minutes plus advertisements. Why would we waste our energy turning the pages one, two, three, when we could sit happily on a lovely baffling, watching people singing and dancing and doing stuff? All I know I learned from telly. The bigger the telly, the smarter the man. You can tell from my big telly just what a clever feller I am. Now take it away, son. You can't learn that from a stupid book. Now, who the dickens is Charles Dickens? Mary Shelley, ah, she sounds smelly. Harry Potter, what a rotter. James Austin, in the compost bin. James Joyce, doesn't sound nice. Ian McEwen, ah, oh, feel like spewing. William Shakespeare, Shwilliam Shakespeare. Moby Dick, hey, easy grandma. All together now, all I know. I learned from telly. The bigger the telly, the smarter the man. You can tell from my big telly what a very clever fella I am. Thank you. Thank you very much.
are we waiting for? Slowly, very slowly, the acrobat wound her shining white scarf over her husband's neck. For luck, my love, she said, kissing him the most gentlest of kisses. <coughs> Smile, we have done this a thousand times. <coughs> but then suddenly, she hugged him with the biggest hug in the world, so hard that he thought she would squeeze all the air out of him. And so, they started to perform, set up for the most dangerous feats ever known to man. The trick started well. The moment the specially designed dress, the acrobat swung into the air. The crowd held their breath as they watched the flames crept up the dress. One second, two seconds, she hurled over the sharks and spiky objects. Three seconds, four seconds, she began to reach her arm towards the cage. Five seconds, six seconds, suddenly the padlocks opened and the huge chain fell away. Seven <coughs> seconds, eight seconds, the door flung open and the escape escapologist reached one huge muscled arm out to catch his wife and the child. Nine seconds, 10 seconds. Oh, I can't look. 11 seconds, and he caught her. And the flames were covered in foam before they could both be blown to pieces. So it has a happy ending. No. No? No. Maybe it was the thought of their child, or maybe it was the nerve. But the escapologists used too much foam, and their hands became slippy, and she fell. No. What, was she okay? Did, did she survive? She broke every bone in her body, but she did manage to live long enough to give birth to their child. Love our little girl, she said. Love our daughter with everything. She is everything. Love our girl with everything. She is everything. And then she died. And then things got worse. What? Worse? Oh no, Matilda, they can't get worse. Not worse. The escapologist was so kind that he never, for one second, blamed the evil sister for what had happened. In fact, he asked her to move in and help raise the child. She was nothing but cruel to little girl, beating her if she did a thing wrong, but <coughs> always in secret, so that the escapologist never suspected a thing. And so, the little girl grew up with the meanest, horriblest, cruelest aunt you can ever possibly imagine! Let's call the police! Miss Phelps, it's just a story. What? Oh, yes, of course. Matilda, you are so clever. Your parents must think they won a lottery having a child like you. Yeah, they always say that. Bye, Miss Phelps. on the clock telling the truth that these cars were knackered. How could I possibly make the mileage go back when suddenly I had the most genius idea in the world? I ran into the workshop, grabbed the drill, plugged the drill into the speedometer, turned the drill on and whacked it into reverse. Within a few minutes, I reduced the mileage to practically nothing. And I did it to every single car. Stop talking now, darling. There's a good boy. But ten, ten minutes later, the businessmen show up. Great big nasty faced apes, dark suits, expensive glasses. And did it work? <gasps> Fantastico! Now I'll be able to afford Rodolfo all day long. <laughs> but they trusted you. They trusted you, and you've cheated them. What's the matter with you? What have we done to deserve a child like you? You know what I'm gonna do tomorrow? I'm gonna go down to that library and tell that old fag that you are never to be let in again! No, no, please don't! And if she does, I'll have her fired and you will never read another stinking book as long as you live! No, no. Now get in there and stay in there, you nasty little creep! At night, the escapologist's daughter cried herself asleep alone in her room. She never said a single word about the ants bullying, and this only encouraged the woman to greater cruelties. A 
until one day she exploded. You are a useless, useless filthy, filthy, nasty, nasty little, little creep. creep. And she beat her and threw her in the dank, dark, dusty cellar, locked the door, and went out. But that night, the escapologist happened to come home early. And when he heard the cries of his daughter, he smashed the door open! Don't cry. Rebellion 
cuts out in the sweat And the Zen will get you sweating And it won't be long before I smell the palm Of aiding and abetting A bit of the dead will tell us who has a head full of rebellious thoughts Hold, ho! Just like a rotten egg close to the top of a bucket of water The smell of rebellion That's not right. Before a weed becomes too big and greedy, you really need to nip it in the butt. Position two. Before a worm starts to turn, you must scrape off the dirt and rip it from the mud. <laughs> the whip of insurgents, the stench of intent, the reek of prepubescent protest, the funk of defiance, the owner of coup, the waft of anarchy and progress. We've exercised these demons. They shall be too pooped for scheming. Some double time discipline should stop the rot from setting in. All right, let's step it up now. Double time. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Discipline, discipline for children who aren't listening, for midgets who are fidgeting and whispering in history, the chattering and chittering, the nattering and twittering is tempered with a smattering of discipline. We must begin insisting on rigidity and discipline, persistently resisting this anarchistic mischief in these minutes you are frittering, on pondering and pitying, while little ones like this they just want discipline. The simpering and whimpering, the dribbling and the spinning and the miss I need a tissue is an issue we can fix. There's no mystery to mastery, the art of classroom mixing. It's discipline, discipline. The smell of rebellion, the stench of revolt, the reek of pre-pubescent plotting, the whip of resistance, the pot of the sand, the funk of moral battle running. <laughs> Imagine a world with no children. <laughs> Close your eyes and just dream. Imagine, come and try it, the peace and the quiet, a burbling stream. Now imagine a woods with a cottage. And inside that cottage we find a dwarf called Zeke, a carnival freak who can fold paper hats with his mind. And he said, don't let them steal your horses. No, no, don't let them take them away. No, if you find your way through, they'll be waiting for you, singing. <laughs> And then, just like I said, the stinky maggot rears his head. Even the piteous, squiddiest mess can harbor seeds of stickiness. Have you ever seen anything more repellent? Have you ever smelled anything worse than that smell of rebellion? The stench of revolt, the reek of pre-subordination, the whip of resistance, the pot. Discipline has washed the singing stench away.
I shall have you wheel again, strapped to a trolley with a muzzle over your mouth. All of these disgusting little slugs shall suffer the most appalling indignity. Because of you. Yes, you. Have you ever wondered the lie I have about how when I say, say red, for example, there is no way of knowing if red means the same thing in your head that red means in my head when someone says red. And now if we are traveling at almost the speed of light and we're holding a light, that light would still travel away from us at the full speed of light, which is still in our way. But I'm trying to say, I don't know if that's somewhere that inside my head. I'm not just a bit different than some of my friends. And these answers are coming to my mind unbidden. These stories are coming to me fully written. And when everyone shouts, they seem to like shouting. The noise in my head is incredibly loud. Just wish they would stop my dad and my mom and the telly. And the stories would stop for just once. I'm sorry, I'm not quite explaining it right. But the noise becomes anger, and anger is light, and is burning inside me, which usually fades. But it is in today, and the noise and the shouting. My eyes are burning, my heart is pounding. Suddenly, everything, everything is with my eyes. Am I strange? Shed. 
I'm not strong like you, Matilda. You see, my father died when I was young. Magnus was his name. He was very kind. But when he was gone, my aunt became my legal guardian. She was mean and cruel, like you could hardly imagine. Then, when I got my job as a teacher, she presented me with a bill for looking after me all those years and produced a document that made me sign every penny. She even produced a document that my father had given him his entire house. Well, is that true? Magnus, I mean, did he really just give her his house? <laughs> I don't know, but I find it hard to believe. Just like I cannot believe he would have killed himself, which is what she said happened. So you, you think she did him in, don't you? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is that years of being bullied by that woman made me, well, pathetic. I was trapped. And that's why you live here. <coughs> this roof keeps me dry when the rain falls. This door helps to keep the cold at bay. On this floor I can stand on my own. On this chair, I can write my lessons. On this pillow, I can dream my nights away. And this table, as you can see, well, it's perfect for tea. It isn't much, but it is enough for me. It isn't much, but it is but Miss Honey, she took your father's house. She took everything that's yours. On these walls I hang wonderful pictures. Through this window I can watch the seasons change. By this lamp I can read. And I, I am set free. And when it's cold outside, I feel no But it is enough for me. This is my house. <clears throat> this is my house. It isn't much, but it is enough for me. She was so cruel to you. 
She beat you. She shouted at you. She locked you up in the tiny cupboards and threw away the key. Stop, Matilda, please. But Miss Honey, your aunt's a murderer. She killed Magnus. Who is she? A contract is a contract is a contract. Miss Trunchbull.
later, the acrobat and escape vulture's daughter received a letter from a solicitor. It said that her parents' will had mysteriously turned up, and she was now the owner of a beautiful old home that had, up until that moment, been owned by the evil aunt, one Agatha Trunchbull. She moved in immediately, and she was very happy, happier than she had been in her entire life. As for Miss Trunchbull, she was never seen again. The Chokies were immediately destroyed, and a new headmistress took over. And her name was Miss Honey, and it's often said that it was the best school in all the land. And you know something else? Matilda was never again able to move things with her eyes. She says it's because she no longer had a need for her powers. And so this is the end. And I do wish I could tell you that this story has a happy ending. I wish so very much that I could tell you that Matilda got all the love she deserved. But perhaps the truth is that not all stories have happy endings. Don't stand there, Gawky. We're going to Spain. Spain? But why? Because this idiot, this nit, this quick brain, thought it would be a good idea to sell 155 capital bankers to the mafia! I didn't know they were the mafia, did I? No, come on, we're leaving and we're never coming back. Let me tell I beg your pardon. I would love to take Matilda, if she'd like to stay with me, that is. I would look after her with love and care and respect, and I'd pay for everything. Would you like that, Matilda? You mean, leave our daughter here with you? Dad, what did you just call me? They'll be here any minute. You just called me your daughter. They're here, you idiot. I told you. I wasn't there with my legs, my beautiful legs. Quick, let's get out of here before what about the girl? Uh, do you want to stay here with Miss Honey? And you want to take care of her? I do. Well, we are a little bit short on room, so... Yes! Thank you, thank you! And Matilda ran into Miss Honey's arms. And she hugged her. And Miss Honey hugged her back. And they hardly noticed as the Wormwood and Rodolfo. The Wormwood and Rodolfo sped away into the distance. Because they had found each other. Yes, they had found.